Canto 3, chapter 17, text 1. We're starting a new chapter today. And the chapter is entitled, Here in Yaksha Conquers the Universe, right? Or something like that. More or less. Okay. So here is our verse. Maitre Uvachu. Maitre Uvachu. Maitre Uvachu. Nishamihatma Bhutva Gitang. Nishamihatma Bhutva Gitang. Nishamihatma Bhutva Gitang. Karanang Sankayo Jitaha Karanang Sankayo Jitaha Tata Sarve Nivan Nivartanta Tata Sarve Nivartanta Deep tree, via divya kasha. Tree, via divya kasha. My tree, uva chum. Nisham yatma bhutva gitang. Karanong sankayo jita. Tata Sarve Nivartanta Tridivaya Dvidivokasha My Tre Uvachum Nisham Yatma Bhutva Gitang Karnam Sankayo Tata sarve nivartanta Tridivaya divaukasha Maitre uvacha Nisham yatma bhagi tang Karanam sankayo jita Tata Sarve Nivartanta Tridivaya Divaukasha Maitre Uvachu Nisham Yatma Bhutva Gitam Karnam Sankayo Jitta Tata Sarve Nivartanta Tidivaya Chivokasha Maitre Uvacha Nisham Yatma Bhutva Gitam Karanam Sankayo Jita Tata Sarve Nivartanta Tridivaya Divokasha Maitre Uvacha Nisham Yatma Bhutva Gitam Karanam Sankayo Jita Tata Sarve Nivartanta Tridivaya Divokasha Maitreya The Sage Maitreya Uvacha said, Nishamya, upon hearing, Atma Bhutva, by Brahma, Gitam, explanation, Karanam, the cause, 
Shankaya from fear. Ujitaha freed. Tataha then. Sarve all. Nyavartanta returned. Tri Divaya to the heavenly planets. Divya Okashaha the demigods who inhabit the higher planets. Sri Maitreya said, the demigods, the inhabitants of the higher planets, were freed from all fear upon hearing the cause of the darkness explained by Brahma, who was born from Vishnu. Thus, they all returned to their respective planets. So, responsibly, Sri Maitreya said, <laughs> the demigods, the inhabitants of the higher planets, were freed from all fear upon hearing the cause of the darkness explained by Brahma, who was born from Vishnu. Thus they all returned to their respective planets. So here is the purport by Srila Prabhupada. The demigods who are denizens of the higher planets are also very much afraid of incidents such as the universe is becoming dark. And so they consulted Brahma. This indicates that the quality of fear exists for every living entity in the material world. The four principal activities of material existence are eating, sleeping, fearing, and mating. The fear element exists also in the demigods on every planet, even in the higher planetary systems, including the moon and the sun, as well as on this earth. The same principle of animal life exists. Otherwise, why are the demigods also afraid of the darkness? The difference between demigods and ordinary human beings is that the demigods approach authority, whereas the inhabitants of this earth defy authority. If people would only approach the authority, then every adverse condition in the universe could be rectified. Arjuna was also disturbed on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, but he approached the authority, Krishna, and his problem was solved. The conclusive instruction of this incident is that we may be disturbed by some material condition, but if we approach the authority who can actually explain the matter, then our problem is solved. The demigods approach Brahma for the meaning of the disturbance, and after hearing from him, they were satisfied and returned home peacefully. My tre uvacha nisham yatma bhutva gitang karnam sankayo jitaha tata sarve nivartanta tridivaya divaukashaha. Sri Maitreya said, the demigods, the inhabitants of the higher planets, were freed from all fear upon hearing the cause of the darkness explained by Brahma, who was born from Vishnu. Thus, they all returned to their respective planets. To kind of recapitulate and uh, uh, focus on where we are in this story and how we got to this point, Immediately, we can see that um, uh, the demigods were disturbed by the uh, growth of the embryo in the womb of Diti, which was spreading darkness everywhere. And uh, so they approached Brahma to try to mitigate their fears, and Brahma explained that this was the um, seed of Kasyapa, which was the two gatekeepers, Jai and Vijay, and that uh, two very great demons would be born, and uh, Vishnu would come himself to dispatch these demons. 
And of course, that's what will happen in the uh, next chapter. Uh, this whole section really goes from basically about uh, chapter 13 to chapter 18. Uh, if we go all the way back to chapter 13, where first we hear about this battle between Hiranyaksha and Varahadev, that's where um, we lead up to this story. Um, and um, at that point, we uh, just have a brief overview of the, uh, the story of how Vishnu, in the form of Varahadev, will uh, kill here in Yaksha. And then um, now we're going to hear the details of what led up to that, how um, uh, here in Yaksha was challenging everybody, and eventually he will challenge Varuna, the demigod in charge of the waters. And Varuna will not fight him, but uh, suggest instead that he fight Vishnu. And then here in Yaksha will make a search to find Vishnu and eventually in the form of Varahadev he will actually meet Vishnu and that will be the end of his life. So it will come to be like that. Um, so we find that um, here, here in Hiranyakashipu is considered the older of the two brothers. And he was uh, born in the sense he came out of the womb second, which means that he was the one conceived first. At least that's the way it's described in uh, Srimad uh, Bhagavatam. We also find out that Hiranyakashipu, in one sense, was the more powerful of the two. But of course, both of them were very powerful. And Hiranyakashipu had subjugated the entire universe. He was um, uh, the controller of all three planetary systems. And because of his great um, demoniac mentality, he forbade any kind of uh, spiritual practices. In fact, um, during the reign of Hiranyakashipu, uh, people did not even say... Uh, Narayanaya Namaha to each other. They said Hiranyaka uh, uh, Namaha. So they had uh, to use uh, his name. He was such a tyrant. And um, this is the nature of those who want to impose their own ideas on the world. Now, materialistic people, they reject the rule and the existence of God. So naturally, they reject both the, um, not only rule and existence, but the various values and uh, uh, methods that God gives for people to live. And instead, they want to establish their own methods and their own values. And pretty much our Western society has uh, moved further and further in that direction. And this is not surprising. Uh, that's what we would expect in Kali Yuga, that um, things would become more and more uh, atheistic and materialistic and they certainly have become that way. There was a general understanding that um, uh, humans now are the basis of all uh, ethics, morality, and uh, um, essentially the measure of all. Um, there's this idea man is the measure of all. So Man is a measure of all when one does not consider God. That's how it works.
Friedrich Nietzsche made the famous statement that God is dead. But uh, what he was referring to was that um, humans now no longer believe in God. So therefore, with God missing, there's a big vacuum. And he was very correct in that. <coughs> um, but he felt that that vacuum could be filled by humans creating their own reason for why they exist and why they do things. And from that point onward, in general, um, the philosophical mood of the world, the zeitgeist, started to go very further, very much further in the direction of people just concocting some kind of philosophy concocting some kind of value system or ethics and just thinking, well, nobody's going to tell me that that isn't what I want to do. No one has uh, challenged me. So therefore, this is it. This is what's going to be the new ethics. And so we saw, saw the rise of great uh, epic and failed totalitarian systems you know we had the communist system and we had the system of the Nazis both of those systems were very oriented towards this Nietzschean idea that now man is the measure of everything and so both of them wanted to impose their understanding on the entire world they felt that no one had the right to challenge them unless they were stronger, and they felt strong enough, just like we see here in Yaksha, feels very strong. And when you feel very strong, you are the one that makes the rules because we are not thinking about God. So therefore, if I'm strong enough, I make the rules. And that's what uh, Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha uh, did. And, um, of course, that's what our modern uh, would-be world conquerors would also do. The human mind needs something to root itself in, something to base itself on, no matter what philosophy you adopt. There has to be some... A solid concept that you can place your mental feet on to feel that you're standing on solid ground. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, our material world is conceptually like a big swamp that uh, there's no solid ground really. <coughs> and whatever philosophy you accept, you're forced to deal with things that you can't explain and you don't understand. And uh, that's the way that the material world is. Um, we know some things and other things we can't explain. And if we follow the history of uh, philosophy, especially our Western philosophy, we see many philosophers trying to rise to the platform of explaining some of these things and then failing to be able to make the ends meet. This is the way that uh, philosophy uh, has fallen short. In the days before Greek philosophy, uh, the philosophy of the world was based on some type of religious formula, based on some kind of knowledge of a supreme something or another. You know, in some cases, uh, there were some uh, group of various demigod or demigod figures. Of course, in India, we have the demigods, and uh, the Greeks worshipped demigods, the Egyptians worshipped demigods, and we had, uh, even in the Americas at that time, the, the peoples of America, the 
uh, natives, they worshipped various demigods in Polynesian islands. They had demigods. Everyone had this knowledge that there was someone powerful that controlled the air, someone powerful that controlled the storms, etc., etc., controlling the sun. There were a few odd things going on in the world, like in Mesopotamia, where you had a- another group of people that were worshipped by those at that time that didn't appear to be the same group of people as the demigods that uh, were familiar uh, most of the rest of the world over. So uh, a different group of people. Uh, But nonetheless, there was this idea that there was some codes and they were given and uh, people followed them. There was some priestly class who gave those codes and people followed them. And there were a lot of prescriptions for how things should be purified and why they should be, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, with the start of um, uh, Western uh, philosophy with the Greeks, we start to descend into essentially what begins to become uh, modern materialism. The Greeks, at least the pre-Socratics, were the first to um, create something we call uh, naturalism. They were very in interested. Of course, they weren't really the first, but they're the ones that we pay attention to because they... Uh, And the people who listened to what they had to say made ideas that today exist even in our modern world. These ideas haven't gone away. Uh, They were brought up a long, long time ago. And um, people may not have studied them in college or may not have studied them in any kind of capacity in reading or whatever. But your everyday person walking around on the street has these ideas in their mind because these ideas are said by philosophers and then by people in the media. These ideas are held in general by people who have heard them from their teachers, from their friends, from their parents or whatever. So these ideas exist in our modern world. And these ideas have consequences, and these ideas have been thought and talked about and disputed for many years. So um, a person does not have to take a philosophy course to have come into contact with these various ideas. And if you haven't taken a philosophy course, then likely you are also unaware of uh, where some of these ideas came from and what they lead to. That's the important thing, you know. These ideas come from somewhere and they lead to somewhere. And uh, they've had drastic consequences on planet Earth. You know, The communist theory uh, from Marx is actually not a political system. It's an economic system. But it needed a political system and so that political system uh, was created And then that political system created hell on earth, uh, not just once, but on a number of different occasions in uh, different cultures. So um, this is uh, the outgrowth of philosophies that decide that God doesn't need to be a part of the philosophy. Um, that's not to say that there are cultures who decided that God does need to be a part of the philosophy and also created similar and horrible situations. That's also there. To be able to um, um, communicate with people of our world, people who are around us in various places, to be able to communicate with them. Uh, To some extent, we have to understand how they think and why they think what they think. Um, uh, The most common uh, thing that uh, I think is important to recognize is, I've said this a number of times, that most modern philosophy is bottom-up. Our philosophy is top-down. And most um, 
religiously oriented philosophy is top down and most materialistic philosophy is bottom up. So in other words, we believe that the first thing that existed is a, a supreme intelligence. And we don't have to justify why um, all kinds of intelligent and integrated systems exist because there was a creator. And a creator has the ability to think of how things go together and, and make various uh, interlocking systems which need to function in a very specific way. And everywhere we look in our material world, uh, science just finds more and more and more examples of intricate systems interacting in very complex ways and creating a kind of stability and a kind of order in the world around us. So we don't say that this happened as according to some kind of um, naturalistic or bottom-up uh, primitive things bumping together and creating complex structure, we say instead that there was an original consciousness and that original consciousness was able to organize and make things in the way that they are. And so when we see purposeful action happening in the world by the material world in general, that there's a reason why it works that way. There was intelligence that thought it out. And we also say that the physical world, which um, works according to certain very limited properties, whose physical world uh, is created from another world, the spiritual world, and in the very beginning as it interfaces, as we have the uh, Pradhan and then the Mahatat, this Pradhan and Mahatat become more and more limited, more and more specific in the way that it functions. And therefore, the uh, lockstep, highly intricate way the material world works, its dynamics, the scientists study these dynamics, these interlocking ways are just impositions on an energy that doesn't necessarily have to work that way. So we don't have to explain how uh, things work in such a complex way. It's just the um, uh, limitations placed upon the material world and its energies by the Supreme. He can lift them if he wants to, and sometimes he does that, uh, or he can let them operate the way they usually work. And uh, this is exactly what science studies. Philosophy is actually, originally, it was the thinking about thinking, the big questions. Why are we here? Uh, what's the best way to live? What is this world that we find ourselves born into? Um, it's those kind of questions. And of course, over many years, humans have asked those questions in Western society and come up with certain answers. And a few places along the line, uh, humans were able to systematically study certain phenomenon in the world around us, just certain phenomenon. And those phenomenon were able to be codified, replicated. Those phenomenon were able to be described with mathematics. And uh, because they were reproducible and describable, then those turned into what we now call sciences. But there were things that didn't turn out that way. Uh, only some things from a philosophical perspective wound up making the transformation into what today we call sciences. Um, that if you really look at it, um, there were um, chemistry. You know, people wondered, what is this matter that we're enmeshed in? How does it work? So eventually it was possible to study how various substances interact with one another and to do that in such a systematic way that today we have chemistry. Then it was, we were able to study, you know, um, how forces 
bounce around in the material world when we have moving objects how do they interrelate with one another how does something move through the air how does something roll how does something flow in the water and these all became sciences and one thing we can always recognize is that when something is actually a science then that means that we are able to control it and study it when something is not controllable, then it doesn't really classify as a science. It becomes much, much more speculative. So, for instance, meteorology. We can't control the weather. We can kind of study what it does, and it's a very approximate science. When we get into psychology, we can't control what people think or even directly measure how they think or what they think. So it's a very speculative science. We can talk about how atoms of oxygen and atoms of uh, hydrogen come together to form water, but we can't explain how the universe started because we didn't see it. There was no... Um, uh, television cameras rolling at the time, unfortunately. So we don't know how it started, but we can build up theories. So this is all speculative. Uh, we have, as we've been saying, a top down, not a bottom up. And that's why Darwinism and uh, uh, this theory of evolution is so important to materialists, especially atheist materialists, because it gives them this hope that somehow or other very simple things can knock together and create more complex things. And if we can accept the idea that very simple things can knock together to create more complex things, then why not accept the idea that more complex things can knock together and create even more complex things? So we're building a universe from the bottom up. Um, in general, we see that this is not our experience in the everyday world, uh, that you have complex things and instead of building themselves up, usually complex things disintegrate. If you leave an automobile out in the rain and you don't drive it for you know, years and years and years, it doesn't uh, bump together to create a better automobile. Instead, it uh, kind of turns into a rusting hunk of uh, junk after a short time. And uh, this is uh, a, a, an idea the scientists know well. It's called entropy, that things kind of disintegrate as things go on. So um, not only is there this dichotomy between a bottom-up in a top-down universe, which is the difference between our philosophy or the Vedic viewpoint, and much to the same extent uh, other religious viewpoints. There's also the difference between how things started. Some uh, philosophies uh, claim that things started from matter. There's basically three possibilities. One of them is that things always existed the way they are, so there's no need to talk about how they started. Another thing is that uh, things uh, are gradually evolving from a particular point, or we have the Vedic conception, which things are cyclical, that things start, they go on for some time, then they dwindle and collapse, and then they start again. So that's the uh, Vedic system. There is also um, this point that I was making before, that we say there is an intelligence behind everything. So therefore, there is a person organizing things. From the atheist and materialistic perspective, this becomes the rules of physics, which they feel, they actually worship them the way that we worship the Supreme Lord. They feel that these rules are the way that they are. They've always been this way, and they can never change under any circumstances. So this is the nature of the um, atheist materialistic uh, 
outlook on things that we have. Um, just perpetual rules and we don't have to ask how they came to be. Somehow they're there. Uh, and if we just uh, explore the future by applying these rules, we will understand how things will come about. We can explain everything this way. Again, the material world is like a uh, philosophical swamp. So devotees and those who are theistic, they base themselves ultimately on the supreme, on God in some way, shape, or fashion. Those who are not devotees, they base themselves on these ideas or these principles, these scientific principles, which to them are completely inviolable, that uh, they feel that these things are how we explain everything. So if you have an explanation and it has mathematics and it has uh, various um, uh, physical and uh, material formulas in it, then that's acceptable. However, if you have an explanation and it talks about the Supreme Lord and various energies, that's not acceptable, at least in the modern way of thinking. So this is what counts as an explanation. Um, what's there too is among those who have some notion of God, and this is described in the uh, ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, you know, um, we have this idea that we have what, what Prabhupada calls the Mahatmas, those who worship the Supreme Lord, and they engage in his service, and they're always chanting. So uh, that's there in the ninth chapter. But then you have 915, where we discuss that there is actually... Um, well, before we get uh, into that level, there's another group which are called the Sukratinas, which are mentioned in chapter 7 of Bhagavad Gita. The Sukratinas are those who are the inquisitive, the uh, desire of wealth, the one in distress, and the jnani. So these are the four kinds of Sukratinas. These are people who believe in some kind of uh, organizing force in the universe and uh, they tend to feel it's a, uh, a being of some kind or another so uh, those who are approaching God for relief of their suffering so uh, there's an idea that there's a being who has intelligence and he can be approached then you have those who are approaching God for wealth Again, the same idea there. Then you have those who are inquisitive. Well, what's the nature of this being? And finally, those who are jnanis who have deeper knowledge. So these are other levels of understanding of the supreme. Now, below them, uh, in 915, we have the three other categories, which are the ekatvena, the one who believes that the supreme is some kind of, of one thing. Uh, usually we call this impersonalism. Uh, one that believes that the um, supreme is somehow the Brahman. Then we have the Bahuda, uh, the Ekatvena, Prithakvena Bahuda. The Prithakvena Bahuda is the person who believes either many gods or believes in some concocted for, uh, thing running the universe. And then below that, we have the Vishvatamukh, which is the uh, person who believes the universe is God, which is kind of uh, what we call pantheism. So these are various conceptions of God, but they're all conceptions of God. These are kind of above the platform of atheism, where your conception of God is, is it's a bad idea. That's what your conception of God is, you know, so... Um, these are different ways people view the universe. And depending on your completeness of your understanding of God is how well you'll be able to explain things and uh, how much you'll be able to please the Supreme. Or if you don't have a very good concept of the Supreme, you won't be able to please him very well. You'll actually, um, you may actually displease the Supreme Lord. And, of course, if you're an atheist, you're not even interested in pleasing him. So um, these are 
various conceptions. We live in a world where all kinds of people have all kinds of conceptions. And uh, when we're discussing with people, um, it's, I think, important to get a sense of what their view of things is. In most cases, people don't have a very deep philosophy. Their philosophy is just a few, few sort of scattered, um, what you might call, um, few scattered um, shibboleths or um, few scattered uh, uh, truisms, and that's about as far as it goes. But sometimes people have a more evolved philosophy. They've actually thought about it. So in the long run, uh, maybe not across the prasadam table from somebody at the Sunday program, but Krishna consciousness will be spotlighted to have to answer questions that scientists and atheists and people who are, you know, in academia uh, those questions that they challenge. So in doing that, we have to, um, somebody has to learn how to be able to uh, take those questions and think about them and reply to them, not in an obviously overtly dogmatic way, but in a way that is uh, reasonable, where we can explain this is what you believe, and even from a Western philosophical point of view, this belief has its problems. But we have a different concept, and this is what the Vedic concept is. Have you ever thought of that? You know. So uh, in this way, I think that uh, we will be able, you know, we won't win all the battles because some people are convinced of a particular philosophy and they're not going to change. Uh, but... Others may be won over if we can present what we need to say in a way that's reasonable and shows we haven't uh, been living under a rock or never come into contact with Western philosophy at any time in our lives. You know, uh, All of us basically, even if you're from India, grew up with a Western philosophical slant, even if you don't know it, you know. You, as I was saying before, your teachers, your parents, the society you grow up in has certain values, understanding, certain things it takes as legitimate, certain things that don't need to be proved when you say them in a, uh, in a circle of uh, human beings. Other things which if you say them, you have to definitely show some evidence for because uh, other people don't believe them. Okay, so... Uh, I want to leave some time for uh, questions and uh, response, if there are any. Uh, any questions or comments? Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for a very interesting lecture. Uh, I have a question like pertaining to the last point that you made, that sooner or later we'll have to face and we'll have to be in a discussion and explain the points. But um, <clears throat> I'm interested, how far can we go into um, uh, like adopting to the current um, event structure? Like, here, let me give you an example. Like, Bhakti Not Thakur in Krishna Samhita, he writes a few things that are obvious that he wrote them just to kind of cater to the public, to get them to like to step to step forward from the um, like a Bhagavatam way, the Bhagavatam explains the events, and then like basically he explains it, you know, right? How he explains like the events as like pertaining everything happened on the earth and everything, everything, like as, as if everything has happened on this earth. Like there is no other planets, nothing. He writes mm -hmm. that kind of canva, and then he goes deeper into the philosophy of, like internal philosophy of Krishna consciousness, mm -hmm. and it is explained that he did that to, um, like, rem like get past that that that, that breaking like the, the people's guards against it. Oh, okay, now you're starting with the with the with the mythology. We don't want to do the. Mm -hmm. So he does that to step over that to let these people go and actually access the. Uh, What's, what, what matters is the eternal esoteric meaning of things. So my question is, how far can we go like 
in our current situation with the current world, what's happening, into presenting these things? Well, I, I think we don't really have to go very far in that direction at all, you know. Uh, um, there are, I think, reasonable explanations for everything we say. We don't, uh, and I think what I, I'm actually seeing in the world around us is that um, a lot of people have skepticism of a hard-nosed, materialistic, um, atheistic viewpoint. So uh, you're never going to really uh, be able to convince people who are dyed in the wool, atheists, materialists, you know. But people who are not <clears throat> already completely sold on that uh, kind of outlook in life, those people we can reach. And uh, I don't think we need to um, uh, go so far. Um, over the, the, the years, as the years go on, um, certain things are starting to lose their um, chokehold on the culture in general, you know. At one point, you know, people would give a strong argument for Marxism or something like that, you know. Uh, people are not so eager to do that anymore. It's hard to defend it, you know. Uh, uh, similarly, um, uh, that we would find a scientific answer for every question at one point was a real strong uh, uh, mood in the zeitgeist or the world view at the time. But now I think most people realize that's never going to happen. Or at least there's a large amount of people who can understand that we're always going to have partial knowledge. Even scientists talk like that these days. That whatever knowledge we have is only partial knowledge. And tomorrow we may um, actually say the opposite thing. Uh, so there was a book I recently read called The, uh, uh, the Half-Life of Facts. <laughs> that, uh, the Half-Life of Facts. Facts. Facts, yeah. <laughs> that uh, in modern scientific or even in academia, you, you have books being you know, written and distributed to students in colleges about a particular uh, field of human study. And those books are changing, and, uh, and they change, and then they change, and then they change again. And what might be in the textbook of five years ago will be different in this textbook this year, you know. And so it's reasonable to expect that next, you know, uh, five years may have other things. He gives all kinds of examples about this. Uh, uh, but at any rate, the point that I'm making is that... Um, I think we can be pretty straightforward about most things, uh, again, knowing that some people are never going to accept. But at least if you can give a reasonable, you know, not just a, it's that way because it's that way, you know, because our scriptures say it. They may say it, but for a lot of other people, that won't uh, do the job. Uh, and, you know... I think that at the time of Bhaktivinod, there was um, much more of a, a sense of people looking towards science to be able to explain everything. And now we live in kind of a post-scientific world where we realize science is never going to, you know, do that bill. I mean, some people don't realize that, but uh, but at least there's more of a, a thinking in that way. So, um, but. To say things in a systematic way, in a reasonable way, is, I think, how eventually we'll be able to win over a large segment of uh, the human uh, population. At least, you know, some people are not philosophical or scientific at all, so they won't know the details. But um, some people who are will eventually, you know, change around and that will change around some of the others so uh, and that's why we have things like the bi now and we have uh, other groups that are addressing um, various challenges that are coming our way 
So uh, I think that's important. You know, uh, we have to accept and uh, answer various challenges, and I think we can do so reasonably without having to, um, you know, hide around so much. You know, um, it, also these days everything is known on the internet anyway. So uh, there's very little point in trying to pretend that we're something we're not. Uh, and I, I generally don't recommend that uh, approach. You know. Yeah, and this also I had a feeling like this. So, like now the the times are not so strict. Like any anything flies now, basically. And Prabhupada he felt that. That's why he came as as he is, and he presented it as he is. Even wore the same cloth, although his god brothers, uh, we know how how that went. They, they went, they came back wearing the, the Englishman cloth. So Prabhupada felt that. So that these are the times that are starting that. Like actually, the more unique you are, even in your appearance, that there, it, it may be even more attractive. Mm -hmm. And like we we can see that on the internet, all these like theories fly. Even like there's many people that are seriously taking the the flat Earth and they're discussing the details and like doing the calculations, everything. <laughs> so like there is no point in catering to like if you cater to somebody, basically be some group. But because of this big informational sphere that we are having access. To, to right now, we are like we are so used to it, but it's actually unheard of. I know. Was there any time in the in the past that was like that? Like we, we know about Sanjaya telling to Dhritarashtra, opening up the scene of the of the wealth of Kurukshetra, but now everyone can just do that through these yantras that we have that we carry on our bodies every day and every time, and everyone is connected to that. And it's just like it's 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 fantastic how 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 big of an opportunity that opens for us, and it's. Kind of sad that that not enough devotees realize that and like doing doing effort. But there is it's good that it's it's picking up. What I'm noticing is picking up, and you're presenting these things as as they are, and people people are taking heed. They're noticing it. And, but it's a long way long way to go. <laughs> well, there's a certain very narrow scientific viewpoint that is starting to lose ground. You know, that uh, viewpoint that everything is material, everything can be explained only by material uh, forces, and there's no purpose anywhere, there's no God. Um, this very narrow viewpoint um, can explain some things, especially those things that are easily controllable and can be uh, measured or investigated through a scientific process. but. The rest of the world, it has no no grip on. It has no explanation for. We can't explain why we like certain things, why we don't like certain things. We can't explain ethics. Ethics is an important thing in our world. Uh, somebody has to decide what we should do and what we shouldn't do. What's punishable and what's not. You know, and science really doesn't help us with that. You know. Um, and um, this scientific, uh, hard-nosed, uh, very narrow viewpoint doesn't help us with explaining all kinds of strange phenomenon that most people at one time in their lives will experience. So what do we do with that? The hard-nosed scientific viewpoint says you just pretend it doesn't exist. But people who've had that happen to them or had that intersect with their lives, they can't pretend it didn't exist because it did happen to them. So, you know, this is the way. Even history, you know, we're starting to realize that there are so many things which don't make sense according to our uh, the history that you and I grew up studying in school, you know. The pyramids were built by Egyptians, you know, with these big pulleys and uh, rolling logs and things like that. Um, it's like millions of tons of stone were moved this way and placed so exactly that our modern buildings in New York City are put to shame by the exactitude with which the stones line up, you know. So somehow an ancient culture was able to do this, but our modern culture is still unable to do it. And so there, there's lots of things like that, which is starting to dissolve, or at least it shows, that the world around us is less understood than we uh, um, tend to make it out to be. And if these mysterious areas are there, are we going to pretend they all don't exist forever, or we're going to investigate them in some kind of way? These are actually 
investigatable in a scientific way, not maybe in the same way that chemistry is, but uh, there's still, we're still able to investigate them in some way. And um, we can't just shove them under the rug. And I think that um, that's where there's a good preaching opportunity. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. So thank you all for hanging on in there. So thank you all very much for your kind attention. All glories to Srimad Bhagavatam. All glories to Vaishnava devotees of the Lord. Hare Krishna.